My name is Ross White. I'm the Dean of Distance Education uh, here at the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. I'm also an instructor in our Humanities Department. And today's session is going to be on personalizing learning for the gamer generation, which should immediately appeal to uh, all the geeks who are here. And in fact, maybe you have self-selected and we're all geeks here, which would be uh, okay by me. Um, I, I will say I'm not an, an expert by any means on... Uh, on generational differences, but I think we're, uh, we're going to be well served by spending a little time in looking at some generational looking assumptions some generational that assumptions affect us that around, affect school. around school. I am getting a little feedback, so if you would please make sure that your microphone is muted. That would be exceptionally good for the rest of the session, and we'll stop and remind folks of that every so often. Um, so the history behind this presentation is that uh, I uh, had the chance to start thinking about this, um, well, as a gamer. Um, I, I come to education as somebody who's deeply, deeply interested in games and game-based learning um, and have started spending some time thinking about uh, why is it that as we get into schools, uh, we have kids who are ready for certain challenges and sometimes the adults' expectations don't match. And where are those mismatches? And how can, we, how can we think about those mismatches in terms that are useful for schools? And so that's really where today's presentation came from. Um, I'm going to try to talk for about 35 to 40 minutes and then open things up for some Q&A. However, uh, if you have got some questions or comments, um, please feel free to raise your hand at any point during the presentation. Uh, or you can text your questions uh, in through our chat window on the side. Um, and the able Carol Stern is here. She's going to be helping me to moderate so that uh, while I'm staring at the camera and looking really engaging for you guys, um, she's going to be making sure that I don't miss any questions um, and that I take them all at the right time. So I want to want to start with just sort of an overview of what some of the generations are um, that we're going to encounter in our schools, and I really do have to sort of set one caveat for today's presentation, and that is there are going to be some gross, gross generalizations, all right? So as we kind of talk about some of the characteristics of these generations, you might say, well, I was born in 1964, and I don't fit that at all. I totally fit into Gen X. Well, the beginnings and endings of these generations are certainly very slippery, and I think if you ask any social scientist who spends any any uh, energy in this area. They'll give you different dates to start and end. They'll also give you some different uh, generational characteristics. But uh, some of the some of the generalizations that I am going to make today are really based around some of the research that I've done. And at the end of the session, I would be happy to share a reading list for those of you who are interested, as well as some other resources that may be useful that'll come up today. So let's talk a little bit about what are those generations that we find in our workplace, in our schools, uh, in our central offices, in our school boards, and what are some of their attitudes. So the first one I want to talk about, uh, the silent generation. It's also known as the greatest generation. Uh, this, is, this generation born roughly between 1922 and 1945. As America has transitioned into the industrial age and starting to transition into the post-industrial age. This is a generation that has grown up just after World War I, uh, some of them born in World War II, and we see uh, what we would now consider to be very traditional values in this generation. In fact, uh, some social scientists now refer to this generation as the traditionals. So what are some of the values that we see from that generation? Well, the first hard work. This is a generation that placed great value on putting your head down, getting the job done, and then moving on to the next job. So hard work is one of the core values of this silent generation. And obviously that has some real effects on the workplace um, insofar as they're going to be very focused on making sure that they're productive at every moment at work. Another value that we see very widely in this generation is a respect for authority. The silent generation uh, is one in which there was still a tremendous amount of respect for institutions. The American government 
uh, was sacrosanct for this group. Um, they had uh, a strong sense of hierarchy in the workplace and uh, a real sense that they should defer to anyone who had a higher status in the workplace. So this idea that the company president must have, uh, must have some characteristics that make him or her, uh, often him, a, uh, a valuable member of the company uh, and therefore we should defer to that intellect, to that thinking, that's very prevalent uh, in the silent generation. This is a generation that greatly valued sacrifice for the family, for the company, for the school, uh, and for our country. And we saw this enacted in both World War I and World War II, that the silent generation uh, placed a great deal of emphasis on putting the needs of the group ahead of the needs of the individual. They, this is a generation that sacrificed for their children and so we see the silent generation very focused on making sure that life is going to be better for their children, for their grandchildren, and for their great-grandchildren. They were also very focused on making sure that life would be better for Americans in future generations. The final sort of general characteristic I want to give you about the silent generation is they didn't have a great need for feedback in the workplace. They didn't have a need for feedback in their own lives uh, in many cases. Quiet was good. No news is good news. Um, so I said earlier this was a generation that wanted to put their heads down and get the job done. Uh, and they, they were able to measure success by was the job done well. They didn't necessarily want or need anybody to come in uh, and tell them about that. So we're going to see how that's very different from some of the generations that follow. So uh, I'm going to take a moment and just kind of stop and, uh, and give you an opportunity to let us know in the chat window uh, if you have some other observations about this generation or any questions so far. It doesn't look like anything's popped up just yet. From Paula, um, who said to everyone, these are all spot on in my opinion. All right, thank you, Paula. And again, remember they are gener uh, generalizations about the generation, so we're certainly going to see people who will behave against these expectations, but these are, uh, these are stereotypes in some ways, but they're useful heuristics. Let's talk a little bit about the baby boomer generation born uh, starting right after World War II. Uh, some social scientists will say that they were born uh, towards the tail end of World War II and ending in the early 60s. Uh, the baby boomers were the products uh, of households where sacrifice was a key value. And so uh, this was a generation that felt uh, in some ways when they were growing up that they should be sacrificed for. They focused then very much on personal fulfillment. Uh, they, this was a generation that felt like, hey, you know, uh, after, after all these sacrifices have been made, why not, why not enjoy it just a little bit? And yet, that value of hard work that their parents had had was very much passed on to the baby boomers. This is the first generation where we start to see workaholism and uh, a generation that spends more time at the office than with family. Um, a lack of work-life balance is really first noticed here in the baby boomer generation. That's not to say that we don't have a, we don't have a cultural history in America of, uh, of people working all the time, but this was a group for whom they may have had the means to not work all the time, but those values of hard work kept them uh, consistently pursuing uh, achievement in the workplace. This, for this group, uh, the way that they preferred to get feedback was in the form of compensation. This was not a generation that necessarily wanted to be appreciated in verbal terms. They wanted 
to see the money that was going to go along uh, with the hard work that they'd done. And they believed that they ought to move through the, the corporate hierarchies and the social hierarchies that their parents had observed so rigidly. So show me the money, show me the title, make sure that rather than just thanking me, you remunerate me for all that hard work. Uh, and that, again, that feeds that sort of um, imbalance in the work life, uh, in the work life setup. So you can see how in some ways the baby boomers were, uh, were sort of a logical response to the silent generation. Uh, or the greatest generation. And in much the same way, Gen X follows along, uh, follows along a certain trajectory. So starting in the mid-60s, ending in the mid-80s, Gen X uh, was the first generation that really noticed their parents' absence. If the baby boomers were workaholics, Gen X was the first generation of latchkey kids. They spent a lot of time alone. They spent a lot of time caring for themselves uh, when they were young. So they became very self-reliant at a very young age. And we see in Gen X, we see a strong spirit of entrepreneurship. Even uh, in, in folks who did not take entrepreneurial jobs but took more traditional jobs, they bring a more entrepreneurial work style into uh, the work setting. Gen X tended to want structure and direction. And I think, again, that this is... This has something to do with, uh, with not only becoming latchkey kids and, and self-reliant at a very early age, but still looking for the parental influence. Uh, but also, Gen X is still sort of looking at the, the hierarchy that was so rigidly observed by the silent generation and that the baby boomers aspired to move through, uh, through their careers. Gen X also looks at that. And now we're starting to see that hierarchy weaken just a little bit. Uh, in Gen X, but there is still a desire for direction. Now when we think about the workplace and we think about people who move into leadership positions, these three generations tend to work fairly well together. So the silent generation values hard work, uh, they respect authority, the baby boomers want to move into those leadership positions, but they're willing to do so in very traditional ways, and they're willing to do so also with hard work. Gen X comes in, they want structure and direction, and when they're the youngest generation in the workforce, this works out extremely well. These three gen generations work uh, very much in harmony together. And Gen X is the first generation that really in the workplace starts looking for feedback. They really want to check in, they want to know how they're doing, and they want people to notice how they're doing. Uh, and those, those ways of noticing with Gen X aren't necessarily tied to promotions or to money. Occasionally they want to be thanked for a job well done. So I'm going to take a moment break there, see if, uh, see if these observations are making sense. Carol's going to take a look in the chat window and uh, so let us know if you have observations just yet before we move on and look at a generation that's a little bit different. Take a moment if you've got it. Type any observations. No need to do so if you don't have anything at this time. If you're just happy listening, we're in good shape there too. All right. Well, I'm going to move on. Please feel free to, to share your thoughts in the chat window. But let's talk a little bit about the millennials. Um, there's one more thing we have to know about Gen X because it's going to it's going to make life a little bit different for the millennials. Gen X, our generation of latchkey kids, our generation that was looking for a little bit of structure and direction, as they become parents, they start to think, I want to provide that presence. I want to provide that structure. I want to provide that direction. And so that's really where we see the birth of the helicopter parent. So the latchkey kids grew up to be those helicopter parents and gave rise to the millennials, 
born roughly in the mid 80s through the beginning of the century and these are the kids who are now in our schools uh, these are the kids who are now working their way into our workforce some of the older ones um, and these are the first kids who grew up with video games and that's going to be important in just a minute but let's talk a little bit about some of their attitudes some of their assumptions first off this was a generation that grew up it's the first generation to grow up with cable tv it's the first generation to grow up uh, with the commodity internet though not everybody in this generation has it to start out so this is a generation that's very comfortable with multitasking and as a result they're always looking for what's next they want the next big challenge they want the next big thing they become a very tenacious group especially when um, uh, when older generations compare themselves to the millennials simply because they're handling a much higher volume of information very seamlessly uh, since they've grown up with it so they seem to be very tenacious um, and in some ways uh, as they enter the workplace they can sometimes feel aggressive uh, to us because they are so hungry for the next challenge and because they've had so much structure um, they're they're looking to participate so they're a highly participative generation this generation more than any before it believes that an individual can change the world and because they've grown up with um, reality television because they've grown up with the internet uh, they have a sense that an individual can have a worldwide reach. Uh, they're, they're very sort of fluid with this idea of going on YouTube uh, and broadcasting out and comfortable with being seen in many ways. Now, for this group, because those helicopter parents were always around, but because those helicopter parents were also engaging their kids as friends, as they move into the workplace, this is a generation that feels like authority is uh, maybe ever present in their lives, but authority and friendship are not so different. And you can see how that's going to cause some generational differences with our generations that greatly respected hierarchy because the millennials will tend to act and participate like authority is uh, authority figures are equal to them. They don't see those rigid hierarchies uh, quite so well. And because they're highly participative, they also tend to want meaningful feedback on a regular basis. And folks, they do not want to wait for it. Now, you've probably dealt with students or young professionals who show up and they say, hey, why haven't you responded to me? And you kind of say, well, you know, when, when, did you, when were you in contact? And this person says, I sent you an email 20 minutes ago. Uh, and you think, oh my gosh, that's a, that's a crazy expectation. But in fact, uh, that kind of instantaneous feedback is something that millennials crave, and they've had a whole lot of it. We can talk a little bit more later about why they've had so much of it throughout their professional careers. This is also a generation that greatly wants to collaborate and work with other creative people. And because they have access to the commodity internet at such an early age, they've been finding peer groups that are very different from the peer groups of the silent generation, the baby boomers, and Gen X, whose peer groups were mostly geographic. The millennials are forming peer groups in terms of affinity because they have so much more information available to them. All right, so I'm going to stop there for just a moment, see if we've got any observations in our chat window and folks feel free to to chat these in as we go you don't have to wait for us to stop but uh, just want to make sure that you guys are getting what you hope for out of this presentation all right and while we're waiting for that to happen I'm going to move on to our next slide so our Millennials uh, are going to be sort of the focus of what I want to spend the rest of our time today talking about. And specifically, I want to think about how our millennials consume content. Because our digital natives have very different attitudes and habits about information, about the content that we find in schools. Um, and those habits and attitudes certainly start to come into play as they enter the workforce as young teachers uh, and young administrators even.
This is a group that has less of a need for a personal knowledge base. And you guys have all seen this happen because when you ask a question, the first thing that our millennials do, they think, well, I'll just look that up on Wikipedia. The group knows it, therefore I don't need to know it. Um, and you know, this, this is an attitude that starts, you know, we start to get into this even with Gen X. When Gen X has, has really good calculator tools, there's, there's a great outcry. Well, how will they learn math if they have a calculator? And Gen X is the generation that starts to answer, well, if we have a calculator, why do we need to learn math in the same way that we always have? So think about that principle applied to almost every facet of information. And now you've got a sense of how this generation is going to be uh, consuming content and how they're going to view the need for their personal knowledge base. They actually are going to feel more like their needs are, uh, are identifying problems, retrieving information out of large sets of data, and then solving problems with it. So this is a generation that is starting to see the need uh, for aggregating all of these different knowledge bases and being able to search effectively within them and make connections. So that critical thinking that we're so desperate to teach in schools, this is part of why. Uh, because the sort of classical uh, model of whoever has the most knowledge is the most powerful, well, the internet has started to equalize that. So I have a comment uh, that Nell Hyatt gave us, which was that um, when we were talking about instant feedback, that other generations are beginning to, to want instant feedback concerning the have you read my email kind of comment. And so the, the generations learn from one, each, one another. Absolutely. And that is actually sort of the joy of, of having a multi-generational workplace. Even when we encounter some of the frictions, uh, when we're able to have conversations and recognize some of these differences in work style and generational attitudes, uh, we're often able to pick and choose. And um, I think we currently are working at a really exciting time where we're able to to do more of that picking and choosing just by having access to so much more information. So now that's a great point. I appreciate that. So one other one other thing I want to point out in in terms of how millennials are consuming content um, is that millennials have a need not only to understand uh, the world around them the peer culture, they have a need to nourish it and to find ways to influence it. And we actually see this come into play with content. Millennials have a need not just to receive content, but to interact with it, to embellish it, and to influence content. So again, very participatory. Um, and when we think about how this applies to our students, students are, are greatly affected by what they perceive as the normal behavior of their peers in the social environment. So I think we're seeing this kind of participative behavior accelerate because everyone has ways uh, to see how that participation is happening. And clearly, that participation uh, is something that's valued across a number of institutions. We're seeing a lot of movement towards um, social justice and, and social um, working on social and progressive causes among young people. Um, and they're greatly rewarded for that uh, through the sort of traditional academic processes. So, um, so kids are, you know, they start with what's going to look good on my college applications and end up with feeling very empowered to change the world uh, by participating in the generation of information. Um, what's interesting about this generation is that the ways just that they consume content are often performative. So these kids have got pervasive networks. They've got Facebook. They've got Twitter. Um, and yes, they're, they're posting to those things. But think about Facebook. Um, with certain plugins, just reading an article on the, on the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post can trigger activity in the timeline. So these kids, just by the act of looking at something or clicking a button that says that they like it, are showing off their their um, consumption habits and in some ways they're performing to that norm that they feel is expected by their peers because they're so sensitive to those peer networks. Okay, That may be a place of unease for some of the previous generations but if we think about it we know that the reason Facebook wants that to happen is that it's data that they can mine and they can make money off of it. In the educational environment Kids are creating a, an enormous amount of data, either individual data or aggregate data, 
when we start to put, uh, put some of their viewing trends, their consumption trends together, and we can use that too. So, uh, it's, so we have to start looking for ways that we can do that. As, a, um, as we think about how kids consume, though, we have to think about what are their incentives for consuming information. And a few considerations have got to come into play. First off, this is a generation that has never dealt with information scarcity. Uh, when I was a little bit younger, if I didn't know the answer to something, well, my mother was going to march me up to the library and say, get into those encyclopedias and look it up. Well, now, if you don't know the answer to something, uh, get out your smartphone and you'll have it in 12 seconds. You know, my willingness to march up to the library, sometimes it was great enough to go get that, that information. I wanted to know so badly that I would make the march, but a lot of times it was just like, oh, I don't need to know that badly. Um, but this, this group, uh, this generation, never had any of that sense that they couldn't just go get the answers. And that information for them has always been free. So their notions of intellectual property seem a little bit different from ours. And I know, uh, I know so many of you in the room today that I know that we've had a million conversations about how do we teach copyright uh, in educational settings where fair use is such a squishy kind of thing. And now we're in a situation where we feel like, oh, this must be plagiarism, whereas this generation says, no, this kind of aggregation among many different sources, this is how life is going to look. So this isn't really plagiarism. So we've got some real mismatches in generational perceptions based on the fact that this group has never had any information scarcity and most information for them has been free. And I will note that uh, that all the images that you are seeing in today's presentation are shared through Creative Commons. So we're starting to see, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, licensing structures. We're starting to see uh, whole websites and organizations dedicated to making sure that information can be free. When we think about this generation's approach to information, we actually start to think that supply and demand at their very basic have been totally different for this generation uh, than they have for previous generations. Every fruit is now in season. Every product is now available on the Walmart or the Target shelves. Because we have globalized our economy, so dramatically, this group has viewed supply and demand very differently, this generation. And that doesn't mean that this generation hasn't dealt with poverty. They absolutely have, but there have been seemingly unlimited product choices almost from birth, uh, a set of choices that can be almost overwhelming. Large-scale economic issues have had a, a huge impact on this generation, um, but our, our millennials have dealt with personal and family issues around scarcity, even at a time when the culture around them continued to consume at a, at a rapid and a massive pace. So particularly in the most recent recession, we've got students for whom this kind of difficulty is very much at home, but it's not reflected in popular culture, and with all the information available to them, they may feel like, gosh, we're the only ones struggling right now in a world of plenty. There's been a, a decrease in faith in institutions and the underlying systems around that when students can't quite make the, the linkages between their, their own issues, of, their personal issues of scarcity and these societal issues in which uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel to them like people are dealing with scarcity, especially at a time when information is so rich. But one of the results um, that that uh, has, has occurred is that these students have a strong value in self-determination. They don't always have the life experience to wield that, that sense of self-determination, but they are, they're extremely motivated uh, in that sense. So I want to stop there because in just a minute I want to talk about how this applies to our schools and classrooms, but I just want to take a moment and see if we've got any other uh, thoughts or opinions about some of these generalizations about the millennial gener generation. Uh, so take a moment, add those thoughts and, and generalizations to our chat window if you've got them. I'm going to take a sip of my Pepsi here. <clears throat> 
quiet group today. Quiet group today. All right, let's talk a little bit about how some of what, what we're talking about actually pertains to schools. Um, when we think about the fact that we have this generation that feels empowered, feels deterministic, and Paula's got a comment um, that she... She's a baby boomer and struggles with interest my students and children have in sharing so much detail about themselves. Paula, that is a great point because uh, we come from a generation that was not performative uh, in the sense that this generation is. This is a generation, again, that's grown up with reality television. They've grown up with YouTube, and they've grown up the sen with the sense that anybody can be a star. Just put your talent on display. American Idols taught us that. And uh, certainly, we've got shy kids in this generation, but I think that that's a generational attitude that, that uh, many of us don't share, and that's a little bit frightening to us. Um, but it's not going to go away, and so we kind of have to think about, well, gosh, what, is, what are the implications for how these kids are going to work in our classrooms? Um, and I appreciate actually that, that you're willing to say that, you're, that you do struggle with that because uh, grappling with that struggle, I think, is one of, the, one of the key things that's going to keep us um, moving forward uh, across generations over the next five to ten years in education. So I'm really glad that you were willing to share that. So. Um, so yeah, this generation that, that is performative, this generation that, that wants some control over their learning processes, how do we, uh, from generations where we, we haven't necessarily felt good about ceding that control, how do we go about doing that? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to recognize that kids control their news sources. Um, Facebook has led to a real content channel mentality, and kids have really started to sort of uh, build networks in which they're able to sort of control the shape of their news. They get their news from trusted sources, their friends, their community members, because the volume of information is so high. And we can put this into place for ourselves. Uh, you guys have probably heard the term PLN or personal learning network, and um, educators are increasingly finding ways to shape their own news feeds by finding trusted reliable professionals that they want to hear from that share some of their same values and um, and can be of use to them as they sort of reimagine the school environment. So the fact that you're here today probably suggests that you're part of a personal learning network or that your personal learning network um, was able to point you to an experience like this, which definitely isn't for everybody. Another way that, uh, that we see control is we we can see control of content to students by allowing them to build their own curricula. And this is, this is tough. In the, in the wake of Common Core being adopted in our state, uh, we need to start thinking about how do we give students some sense of ownership over a core set of standards. And Common Core, what it really provides for us is a structural framework for critical thinking. But we have a lot of options on what the day-to-days are going to look like in our classrooms. Um, and I'm thinking specifically when we start to think about how do we let students build their own curriculum, um, we've got to consider that many students won't intuitively know how that's done. So you're going to hear a lot of presentations in the coming years of giving students control over the content. But we have to be aware that that process is always going to require us to set up good choice architecture. And uh, one book that I would suggest today is a book called Nudge by um, Sunstein and Thaler. Uh, and again, I'll send out a short reading list if folks want it. This, this book talks about um, making sure that we, if we give kids a lot of options, that the default option is the most desirable behavior. So if, if I were to say, all right, students, I'm going to let you choose how this activity works, I might give a platter of options, but the first one that I might give is going to be one that, uh, that I want most students' attention drawn to, and I'm going to hope that they're going to, if they don't have their own path that they're excited about, they're probably going to go for the default. Um, one other piece uh, of information that, I'm, that might be useful that I'd be happy to send out if people want it is, um, I'm trying to put this into action right now. Uh, I have built a syllabus for a poetry writing course that I'm teaching here at the School of Science and Math, and I'm also teaching at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. 
wherein students pick their own reading list and they're given a set of behaviors, uh, a set of um, a set of objectives, and they get to choose which ones they want. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Um, but we're starting to see this idea of game-based classrooms where students choose their own paths through, um, and that's really borrowing from video games in a lot of ways. Um, we also we also need to think about if we're going to allow students to identify um, their own curriculum, if we're going to allow them to identify some of their own content, then we're starting to move to a school setting where everyone has to teach reading, everyone has to teach media literacy, and everyone, regardless of your subject matter, has to start, start thinking about relevant and real-world challenges. Uh, a great example of this is the new curriculum that's rolling out from NCVPS around um, forensics, integrated math, um, and a few other courses in which the courses are structured around the grand challenges in engineering. Giving kids big questions and letting them solve things that are relevant in their own community or in the world around them. So really engaging that sense that they can change the world right there in our classrooms. So that's big when we think about how we give them control of content. We've also got to give them control of some assessments. And I'm sure you're thinking, what on earth is this graphic doing in a presentation about our schools? I'm not comfortable with that. Um, but the first instance, does anybody recognize what this, what this graphic is from? Take a moment. Tell me where you think this is from in the chat window. Why on earth would I be showing this when I talk about ceding control of assessments to our students? So Paula says it's from a video game, and you are correct, Paula. Does anybody have, uh, Chris says Black Ops or maybe Call of Duty? Not quite, but you're thinking close to, the, close to the right lines. Anybody know which game this is from? Some, those were great guesses, by the way, Chris. And you've, you've outed yourself as a, as a gamer as well, if you know the difference between uh, Call of Duty and Black Ops. So this is from a game called America's Army. Uh, and this is a game that's free to play. It's been set up by the US Army. It was developed by a studio uh, here in Cary, and um, this video game allows young people to go on simulated army missions and get immediate and adaptive feedback about how they're doing. It also allows the army to showcase what's interesting about being the army, and it's a huge recruiting tool for them. But what's interesting about this game is it's one of the first where, based on the individual movements of a player, the game adjusts its difficulty level. So Carol, Chris, Roxy, and I could all be playing and we could all be experiencing the game very differently because the artificial intelligence underpinning the game might adjust itself to be a little bit slower for me because I'm maybe not as adept right when I jump in. So these kinds of adaptive feedback networks, which we see a lot in video games, and we're starting to see more uh, in immersive experiences, these are going to make their way into our classroom. Whether it's adapting to what we're doing uh, when we speak, or what we're doing with our hands, or if it's just biometric sensors that watch where our eyes are moving and help adjust the reading instruction based on where our eyes are going. So seeding control over the assessments to our students actually requires building very smart systems that adapt to our students. Okay, um, So this notion that, uh, that feedback could be flexible, that could be adaptive, um, this, this has taken over the game world. Uh, and so how many of you guys this is, this is an image that was created by a college student. I think this one's pretty great. How many of you guys recognize the symbol at the bottom of this image? Anybody know what this is from? The cup thing? The cup thing. What is that? And it's not actually just the cup, but it's also uh, the little logo that says Achievement Unlocked. All right, so it looks like we don't have a lot of hardcore geeks in here. Up, oh, we've got one. I wondered if it was you, Chris. Um, this is from 
the uh, Microsoft has a video game system called the Xbox, and as students or as players play through games in Xbox, they can unlock they can unlock certain achievements, which indicate that they have. Uh, met a certain level of mastery. Sometimes it's completing a difficult level, sometimes it's doing an insane and repetitive behavior over and over, sometimes it's getting into the secret room. Uh, but players are able to see what other players in their friend network have done. So if Chris and I both have the same game, I could see which achievements Chris has gotten in that game because he's got a little badge that goes along with it and he could see what I've done. And these tend to be very, very motivating for a certain set of students. Um, and, and yes, Nelly, uh, we're certainly seeing the generational differences at work. Um, but these, these ideas of having, uh, having these, these, uh, these achievements able to be displayed, it leads us to a very useful notion that's just starting to make it into public schools. And that is that, no, not that, not badgers, but badges. Um, this has been happening, this has been happening for years in Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts, where when a child shows a certain level of mastery, they're able to get something to display that they've been able uh, to master that. This is increasingly um, something that can be used on top of or uh, in place of traditional uh, assessment systems to give kids opportunities to showcase what they know. There's currently um, uh, a challenge going on right now uh, that Mozilla has created an open framework for creating and displaying these badges and, and theoretically these badges may have value across networks and what I mean by that is students may one day be able to collect badges based on subjects that they've mastered in our high schools take and display those badges into the college environment and then take and display those badges into the workplace. Uh, so they might potentially become a form of credentialing. But the wonderful thing about badges, when we think about what's great about Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, and Girl Scouts, is that the badges are rarely prescriptive. We don't tell each Boy Scout here is the path that you have to take to become an Eagle Scout. We simply say there are a number of options and you're going to have to meet a certain level of, uh, of achievement, just like certification. So that's a great comment. What, uh, what I think traditionally has been a certificate on paper can be gamified. It can be made uh, a little bit more inviting and you see the badges here are really sort of um, visually appealing, they're stimulating, and not every student is going to be motivated by that. But when you activate this notion of displaying mastery and giving students time, space, and flexibility to, uh, to pursue mastery, we start to, um, we start to get at intrinsic motivation. How many of you, uh, quick show of hands, how many of you have read uh, Daniel Pink's Drive, which is a book on the sort of surprising truth about what motivates us. Go ahead and raise your hand if you've read Drive. Uh, if you have, you will certainly um, you'll recognize a few of these concepts. So a few of you there, I'll include that in today's reading list for certain. Um, finally, uh, one thing that we need to think about, um, and let me, let me back up to Paula's question, uh, will students be allowed to display these badges or will, will there be an outcry of not allowing this outward competition and accomplishment? And Paula, I think that that is a tremendous point because um, when we start to get into this idea of assessing kids by mastery and then allowing students to show mastery, we're going to start to get into issues of fairness, we're going to start to get into issues of self-esteem, and we're actually going to start to get into some of the core issues of how schools are designed. Right now we're designed on a calendar and seat time model and when we start getting into this idea of giving kids opportunities to master and to show their ma to demonstrate their masteries we're going to have to start to challenge even some of the most basic assumptions about how our schools work um, and i think that we're going to start to see a clash in values uh, this is a generation that wants the control and flexibility over their own assessments but will our schools be set up for them to do that in a way that's fair and equitable across geographies, across socioeconomic statuses? 
um, across even uh, even sense uh, you know minute age differences just because the technology is is evolving so quickly. Um, so the yardstick is constantly moving for all of our kids. So Paul, that's a great question, uh, and I think a real concern as we think about what the what the future of schools looks like. We also need to acknowledge that not all mastery is individual, and um, I talked a little bit earlier about the fact that our notions of plagiarism are changing. I think it's also worthwhile to think about the fact that our notions of achievement are changing as well. Uh, you see here a first robotics team uh, that has come together and won a competition with the robot that they're displaying very proudly up front. We're going to see more opportunities for kids to balance self-pace with collaboration so that learning is not an entirely independent process. We're going to see fluid teams working on projects in schools, those grand challenges in engineering being a really good framework uh, that we can use for that. Um, so with that, I think I want to stop the, the piece where I'm going to uh, just yap and yap and yap. Um, and want to ask you guys some questions. So uh, in the chat window, and please feel free to raise your hand if you've got some observations on this uh, and would like to take the mic for a moment. Uh, I want to talk about, first, our implications for gifted students. Um, so where do you see, with this notion of control over content and control over assessment, flexible, fluid, and mastery-based strategies, what are some of the implications that you see for gifted students? So please feel free to raise a hand. And we can have you take over the microphone for a few if you're, if you're brave enough to do so. Otherwise, please share your thoughts in the chat window. All right, so as Paula notes, tremendous freedom and ability to self-pace. And certainly for highly accelerated students, that's going to be great. True differentiation, I think, Chris, that you've got, you're thinking exactly the right way. Um, and that, that differentiation is, as you note, going to take the form of increased challenges for students. We're always going to figure out where are they mastering and how do we push just a little bit beyond where they're comfortable, because that's the sweet spot for learning. Uh, Nellie says this is going to allow our students to become experts in areas of interest and passion, and I do think that we're going to see highly specialized curriculum uh, in the future, and I think that we will eventually have some difficulty balancing the need for students to pursue those passions but still get um, uh, a, um, a, a, broad and, um, a broad and balanced education so that they become um, balanced individuals. Good other thoughts. Any other thoughts? And please feel free to raise your hand if you want to take over the audio for a minute with some observations. Well, I'll jump in here because I've got the audio shared with you, and that is that uh, teacher training has to be different because um, if the students are trying to direct their own instruction, the teachers have to get out of the way and be the guide on the side instead and be comfortable and prepared to do that. Yeah. Um, and I, I will say, having um, so what I have done this, this semester um, with this uh, individualized syllabus is I've had to sort of acknowledge that um, at any given point, uh, my students may come to me on any given topic. Um, and, and that actually frees you in some way because you quickly acknowledge that you cannot be the expert on all things, nor do you want to be, um, but also they don't expect that of you. They just want to make sure that you know how to engage the networks because they understand that there's tons of information out there um, and they fully expect to aggregate some of it. They generally start with Wikipedia um, and often need some guidance on what are some better sources to start with and how do, how do I engage in new information networks, uh, but it is very useful. So I know a number of people here uh, are involved in school technology purchasing, and I wonder what, what implications do you see with some of these generational changes? What implications do you see for technology purchasing? 
So take a moment, type your thoughts about technology purchasing into the chat window. And again, you're always free to raise your hand and take over the microphone for a few minutes. Nobody's got thoughts on technology purchasing, huh? All right, increased bandwidth, that's a big one. Uh, we're going to have to make sure that we um, look at community Wi-Fi efforts, that we make sure that at, uh, at really any point where students could be studying 24 hours a day, they've got the bandwidth to do so. Uh, this idea of mobile devices um, being in hand, we're going to need to make sure that our devices connect and that we've got networks that can support those devices. Uh, we're going to need to make sure, as Chris said, web-based resources that we can easily update because the body of knowledge is going to be changing uh, so frequently. And Stacy notes that that's going to create some difficulty because we're going to need to make sure uh, that we're keeping up to date pretty regularly. Uh, one thing that I think we're going to see, and we've already started to see it in many districts, is uh, BYOD, bring your own device, to try to make sure that any way that students can get connected, they do. Um, and we're certainly going to see some friction uh, as we move into having students using these devices uh, and multitasking, which is not necessarily a shared generational value, in the classroom. Uh, Paula notes that we're going to have to teach multimedia skills, and um, I think that that is definitely true. Information literacy is going to be absolutely huge because we're going to have to teach kids not only is uh, how to access some of these new information networks, but how to vet what they find there and figure out what, what passes the smell test. We're going to have to set up our schools so that we've got more investments in telepresence. We're going to need um, virtual courses. We're going to need video conference courses. We're going to need small centers uh, available to our kids. Uh, so all of these are going to be really important, which means that uh, we're going to have to make investments in the infrastructure of telepresence, mobile computing, and persistent networks. We're going to need to make sure um, that whatever we do is always available to students because I think we're going to see um, the, this notion of the school day merely being a, an 8 to 3 construct change a little bit. Uh, so great, Gaston County's got a BYOD pilot at a school. Um, and Chris, I think you'll probably be sort of thrilled to get that feedback. I expect that your student feedback is going to be very different than your teacher feedback. And it may be positive on both sides, but it may be positive for very different reasons. Uh, we're going to need to look at adaptive software. And this is something that hasn't fully made it into um, the educational technology arena just yet. But we're starting to see more vendors promise us um, these, uh, these systems that will capture significant performance data, adapt to that performance data, and then present us with that performance data in the aggregate so that we're better able to target interventions even at younger ages. Um, so the software is going to do that for us increasingly. We're going to have to try to make sure that we give them some opportunities um, or that we give our kids some opportunities to use software like that. Paula notes that uh, her, her children had a chance to do a group project they never met in person. Um, I do think that we will start to see more and more of that where students are, who are in um, similar coursework are connecting in very different ways, both synchronously and asynchronously, uh, and they may never be physically co-located. Um, and so we're certainly going to have to deal with issues around socialization as more of this happens because we know that school is not just a collection of courses. We know that school is also about character education and giving kids opportunities um, to experiment and learn how to interact with each other in positive and meaningful ways. One other suggestion I want to make for technology purchasing is that uh, we may want to look at investing in games and gaming systems because there's a lot that we can learn. Uh, from that. In Pender County, uh, a middle school down there has set up the Warrior Gaming Lair uh, in which they're using World of Warcraft and Minecraft as well as a number of Xbox games to teach certain skills. Uh, and kids don't feel like they're learning, but of course we are able to point them to some of the positive behaviors uh, and what they are learning. And that's really sort of the, the cost to play is you've got to be thoughtful 
about what it is that you're doing while you're playing that's going to be useful for you in other contexts. So we're right at the end of our time. Um, I am so glad to have had the opportunity to hear some of your thoughts today. Um, I know that this this presentation probably sort of feels like a very high level thing. As I said at the beginning, these are these are some concepts that excite me. I'm by no means an expert on that. Um, and I, I don't know that this presentation was so much the answers about how we personalize learning for the gamer generation, but rather um, some thoughts along the way as we make some of those decisions together. Um, some of the background information that we need to consider when we think about those generational differences and how they're going to affect our attitudes about how kids learn versus the kids' attitudes about how kids learn. Um, so I uh, certainly am I'm happy to stick around as long as you guys want to be here and take any questions or continue to chat about any, um, any additional topics. Um, but I also recognize some of you guys budgeted only an hour, and I want to be respectful of that. So thank you so much for being here today, uh, and I hope that this will be useful. I'll be happy if, um, if you'd like, please, uh, um, well, you know what, I think I've got everybody's email address, is that right? Right, and right. I'm going to send out to everyone the link to the archive and um, any materials that you would like to send along to. Great, okay, so uh, in addition to the link to the archive, uh, I will be sending out uh, an example of a game-based syllabus and a short reading list. Um, so thank you guys so much for attending, and again, please feel free to stick around and share some of your thoughts, uh, as Paula has, in the chat window.